All right, here we are, live, back on the air, Totally Driven Radio. And, Frank, it's time for interview number two. Are you ready? Are you geared up? Are you ready to go? I, I am more than ready to go for this one. Uh, are you sure? I'm, I'm sure. Okay, you got your hairspray out? Got my hairspray out. I got my spandex on. Well, now they're more like spandones, but... <laughs> You know, you know, for for us, we were never a spandex type of guy. We were that's why Zubaz was always good for us because we just fit so much better into Zubaz and we're much more comfortable as well. Yeah, no com- yeah, no comment. All right, anyway, <laughs> welcome to the air, Stevie Rochelle from Hell from Telf. Stevie, welcome to Totally Driven Radio. How the hell are you doing? Hey man, how are you guys tonight? Good, 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 good. You know, when I was putting this interview together and I was plotting questions for you, I said to myself, do I want to be serious? Do I want to be sludge-like? So I figured I'd mix it up and give you a little of both. That's a good idea because that's kind of kind of the way I roll, you know? All right. So you got to start off the interview and say, you know, what have you been up to? And this is the only time to promote your shit. That's that's the first question. What am I up to? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you start your interviews off with. So, oh, you're saying that's a that's yeah. Well, that that was kind of yeah, a sludge thing uh, yeah. back in the day. Well, <clears throat> I've always got a bunch of pots on the stove, so to speak. So, I mean, the big thing that's uh, kind of on the immediate horizon for us is that we're going to play uh, an East Coast tour and play M3. So we actually start two weeks. Two weeks out from right now in Ohio, we're going to play Cleveland, Columbus, Akron, going to Pittsburgh, which I haven't been doing, God, a long time, probably since the mid-90s. And then we're going to go east into uh, Pennsylvania and play New Jersey, Philadelphia, and at one point end up in uh, Baltimore for the M3 Festival. And, uh, you know, it's a two-week run. Uh, I think we have nine shows on the calendar. There might be a tenth squeezed in. And... uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at right now, and I'm excited to uh, to play some of these places because I have not been to Baltimore or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh um, in some time, at least not with Tough. I mean, I've been there, um, but not, not actually performing a Tough show, so to speak. So I'm excited to get there and play. I was going to say, because I actually met you, and I'll see if you remember this. When you guys played, uh, it was probably around 91, 92, played what the City? Cell Block in Philly. I was going to say the cell block, and it was separated by a chain link fence. If you were underage, you had to go on the right hand side. Correct. And if you were 21, you could go on the left hand side, right? Me, right. And me and my buddy uh, Bill Farley, he had just came back. He when he was living out there with you guys in LA, and he just came back home like that day. And he calls me up. He goes, uh, "Yeah, what's going on? I'm living back home." I said, "Oh, that's cool. Your boys from Tuff are playing to Philly." He's like, "What?" And we went and we met up with you guys, and. Now, mind you, I was like 22 at the time, and I'm thinking, being the big, you know, hair band fan that I was, I was like, wow, I'm going to go meet, like, rock stars and hang out and party with them. And I go to your guys' hotel room. It was you and George. And I'm expecting, you know, you, you know you're picturing in your head, like, this big thing, like, girls, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And we get there, and you guys aren't drinking, just hanging out. And you're, like, exercising and doing push-ups and stuff like that. I'm like... I'm just like looking around, like what's wrong with this picture? Like this is not what I pictured at all. Well, that's a misconception that takes place with a lot of things in life in general. I think people have a, you know, an expectation of something, especially when they're meeting, you know, a quote unquote star. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm a star or I was a star, but you know what I mean. I mean, I, right. when, when I when I first moved to Los Angeles and I was getting ready to go to the Whiskey a Go Go for the first time. Or I read about, you know, Motley Crue playing the Troubadour. And then I actually went into these clubs. I was like, it's tiny. Yeah. Like, you know, 300 people capacity. And I'm thinking, this is where Rat played? This is where <laughs> Motley Crue played? You know, this doesn't look like, you know. Um, and, and so the same thing happens with, you know, with bands. I mean, even myself, once I did move here and I'm now in Tough and we're becoming local, you know, being a, being a, a rock in a rock band, a successful or a headlining band, so to speak, for a you know, a year or two on the Sunset Strip kind of elevates you above a certain crowd. And at the same time, you end up mixing with the next level of crowd. So, you know, in 85 and 86, I'm in Wisconsin, 84, watching Motley Crue in concert and David Lee Roth and Van Halen and Dawkins and Rat. And and then fast forward just a couple of years. It's now 1987, 88, and I'm in Los Angeles. And now I'm hanging out and I end up at 
I see Randy Piper at the at the at the Morning Glory, you know, uh, liquor market on the corner from my house. You know, I'm going in there to buy orange juice, and Randy Piper from Wasp is standing there. I'm like, holy shit, there's Randy Piper from Wasp. You know, um, so that that became kind of a big deal. But it was just he was a regular guy. You know, he bought smokes and whatever, and he walked out, and I was like. You know, he clearly didn't want, you know, you didn't go to a mansion, I don't think, or there wasn't a Lamborghini waiting for him. But, you know, a lot of times there's a perception of the video or the yeah. pinup and metal edge or, you know, the story you read about in the bio, in the bio that was printed in Hit Parader. And you're thinking, wow, man, we're going to go there. There's going to be fucking bitches everywhere and beer cans on the floor. And, and you walked in and, like you said, I was probably in sweatpants doing push-ups and had a bunch of receipts on the bed and – a little uh, <laughs> a ledger keeping track of, okay, how many miles do we have to go tomorrow? You know, how much are we getting paid tonight? How many shirts do we have left? Do we have any CDs we have to reorder? It's a business, you know? It's called music business. It's not called a music party. And that's where a lot of guys somehow get lost in the mix, you know? Yeah, and you know what? It's funny, too, because, um, you know, as you know, hair bands, they fell out of flavor with everybody. And you guys were like, you know, taboo. Like you couldn't like a hair band through the '90s. And then there was like the little resurgence in the the new millennium, and bands started getting back together and playing clubs around the country and all. And you know, as bands were coming through Philly, like me and my buddies would go and I go see them. And then I was, you know, they, you know, they come out afterwards. And now you're having the opportunity to talk with these guys and they're selling their merchandise and you're talking about the old days and stuff like that. But Every time afterwards, on the way home, and I always I would turn to my buddy and say, you know what, the big difference now is like back then it was yeah the big perception it was like such a big production and everything else and it was about being a star. I said, but now the reality of it is this is their guys' jobs. It, it is a business mm-hmm. and this is their work. This is what they do for a living, and you don't really put the two and two together. You know, back in the eighties or when you you know when we were kids trying to live that dream. And you actually, I guess, kind of were different from that because you were always the level-headed business type guy uh, from day one, it seems. Absolutely. I mean, the band, the band Tough was, you know, it was a, a unit, a cohesive unit of four guys that all had, you know, the same goal. You know, and I'm talking from, say, 1987 when, you know, the four of us became like, this is tough and now we're playing it as a band. We had the same goals and aspirations become, you know, what, what we – were initially influenced by, which was Van Halen, Motley Crue, Rat, Judas Priest, you know, and um, we, we, that was our original, you know, influence to, to be a rock band. So, you know, by the time we became, you know, four guys that had kind of, they floundered around with a couple of lineups with, you know, Gillette and a guy named Terry before that. And I was playing in a couple of bands in Wisconsin. And, and then by the time us four were in the same uh, rehearsal room, and they already had a name, a cool logo, and, you know, a handful of songs. And then, then at the same time, literally at the same time, Poison, Faster, Pussycat, Alley, Guns, and Guns N' Roses just all hit, like, you know, a ton of bricks. I mean, Poison's right. record came out in 86, but it really didn't, really didn't take off until Talk Dirty to Me, which Talk Dirty to Me, if I'm right, was released in January of 87. Tough, you know, was playing the Sunset Strip that summer. So it's... It's it's so weird that so many years later, like there's still this this thought process with a certain amount of people in the industry or the band, you know, the bands or the fans or people that Poison became famous and then Tough went, hey, there's a guy with blonde hair and a headband. Hey, let's you know, let's have a cool fancy name and let's be like Poison. That was never the that was never the agenda. I mean, we were trying to be like if anybody. Van Halen or her Motley right. Crue, you know, right. and I think at the same time when Ricky and Brett and those guys were in Pennsylvania, they were doing the same thing. They're like, man, Van Halen's amazing. And wow, this Motley Crue band is just kicking our ass and they're playing around, you know, Baltimore and Pennsylvania or whatever. And at one point they're like, dude, we're going to LA. And that's, that's kind of where our mindset was. And <clears throat> so once we got this thing rolling, everybody had fun and there was a ton of great stuff going on and parties and girls, but the true, the true businessman mind, you know, the the mind behind the band, you know, the brains was Michael 